All right, so good afternoon. Today we are going to be talking about Britain's Cold War culture. Okay, so when I actually say Britain, I mean um, Scotland, England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Uh, since Ireland already, or the, now it's called the People's Republic of Ireland, they, they separated from England in 1921 through a civil war. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Okay, so the key people we're going to be learning about are Queen Elizabeth II, the Beatles, James Bond, and Margaret Thatcher. Um, for Queen Elizabeth, we're going to talk about um, <coughs> her impact on society, being that she was a young monarch who was, whose coronation happened in 1952, so about seven years after World War II ended. Um, we're going to be talking about the Beatles and how their rise to fame kind of broke barriers within the working class in England and around the world in general. Um, and we're also going to talk about James Bond, who inspired like a re uh, uh, resurgence of national pride in England. And we're also going to talk about Margaret Thatcher, who kind of, um, who really helped out in one of the most difficult times in Britain's period. So she had a pretty large cultural impact in the end. And we're going to start with Queen Elizabeth. So it was 1953 um, when when Queen Elizabeth II was coronated, and this is her full title and where she actually kind of rules everywhere, which is Queen of the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Union of South Africa, Pakistan, and Ceylon, which I had no idea she had like those last three ones. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, so her father did die on the 4th of February in 1953, and it's interesting that she wasn't coronated until um, June of that year, oh, 1953, I'm sorry, that's a wrong date. Um, and H M H R M just made her royal majesty's coronation, that's all. Um, her first year of reign was deemed a golden year, which basically means that she reigned, um, or that her, um, that it was just a year of great prosperity for England and that there was just a lot of positive things going on for them and people just ended up liking her, which was great. Um, and then also, the reigning monarchs were seen as a symbol of hope and strength. Um, during the Cold War, there was a speech written out for her to read um, in case there was nuclear fallout, um, but she never ended up reading it. And actually, 30 years later, um, I think last year, they released the speech. And one of the quotes that they have her um, that they were going to have her say was, um, "Our brave country must again prepare itself to survive against great odds." So that would have been said in 1983. Um, so that kind of shows how Britain kind of looks up to a monarch for just any sort of like stability within the nation. It's much more of a symbolic position instead of an actual ruling position because they don't really have any sort of say in parliament. That's why they have a prime minister. Um, so really, they kind of developed this royal culture in England, especially when Queen Elizabeth was coronated. Um, she was young. She was... 1952 and she was born in 1926 so she was like almost 30 years old when she was coronated which is a lot younger than her father um, who was actually King George who they based the film the King's speech off of so it was interesting to see that and also kind of make connections um, so speeches during wartime as well as times of hardship were very are still very common in England um, so that just kind of gives solidity to um, having a queen or any sort of monarch in in any sort of country, just to kind of be like, oh, we're strong, you know, we carry on, sort of thing. Um, so anyway, her her upbringing her upbringing is it's a little stereotypical to think that people in Britain are brought up to have like a super posh accent and oh yes, I eat tea and or I have tea and scones for breakfast every day, sort of thing. But um, it, it really kind of breaks this barrier, especially when we're getting into talking about the Beatles, because they weren't from like a centralized city like London. They were from Liverpool, which is way up north in England, near Manchester, pretty close to Scotland. So they were actually, they, they call people up there like scouses because they work in the boat yards and they do all the manual labor. So that's what they're kind of known for. They're not really known for any sort of like cultural boom. That doesn't happen until like the 1980s and 1990s. But ever since 1962, um, the Beatles kind of gave Liverpool a name, besides being a big shipping yard, because they were just four, four boys who grew up in, during World War II who barely survived. Um, John Lennon's dad actually 
left him to go off to war, and that was pretty hard for him. And his mother died also, which was very tragic, and definitely a lot of that affected him in his career. Um, but to show that these four guys, just John, Paul, George, and Ringo, or Richard, um, they just kind of grew up in a very hard time. They grew up in a working class family. So what can we learn from this? From knowing what World War II was, and knowing like what was what was being fought, and like kind of like an emergence of human rights, along with just groundbreaking things that were happening in entertainment, like Elvis Presley going to war for America, for example. Um, what can we learn from the Beatles, just from like their upbringing in society? Because these these guys ruled the world in 1964. <laughs> But they had no, or no one had any idea of who they were when they first started out in 1959. They were out in the cavern club just working so hard, not even eating, touring throughout Germany. But yet these working class boys ruled the world in 1964 until 1970 when they broke up. Isn't that amazing? That you could come from nowhere and end up ruling the world. Okay, so yes, their musical career spanned from 1959 to 1970. Um, so they, they possibly had one of the largest impacts on rock and roll. And this is all coming from, like I said, emphasizing, a <laughs> working class. So it, for Americans, I'm not too sure about how they thought of England before rock and roll. I mean, they saw, they saw the queen, they saw the king at one point but they never really gave thought to like the working class. They only saw soldiers, they saw hardships, but they never saw like actual citizens outside of London. So just kind of like putting Liverpool on the map with the Beatles is something huge that happened. Um, so yeah, each Beatle had uh, success after the disbandment and each became active in the protest culture, John Lennon most notably. Um, but also we could learn from the Beatles you know, the Rolling Stones came out of this. They came from a small borough outside of London, and they also came from nothing and ruled the world at one point. So did the Who, and just a bunch of other cultural icons came from small beginnings, whereas people might, might not recognize or kind of make any sort of connection between, like, working class mm -hmm. into huge success, like, unimaginable success. So, that. Okay, so fiction and heroism. So 1962 also brought us the first uh, James Bond film called Dr. No. Um, James Bond was actually written by Ian Fleming in 1953. Um, Ian Fleming actually did serve um, in World War II, and I believe a little bit in World War I. Um, so he did write the Bond character as like his own little adventures, and as also just like a little free space for him to think about stuff and just for fun, really. Um, so James Bond, the gadgets are very quirky, but the imagination is there. And I think that, especially with James Bond as a character, during this time, during the Cold War, it kind of gave Britons an idea of like, you know, what could possibly happen if there is nuclear war, what sort of enemies are out there against the Russians or any sort of other communist parties out there. Um, so super spies and espionage were popular in Britain during the Cold War because, um, Mainly, well, actually, the majority of people who did write about Cold War espionage uh, fictional characters, they did serve in World War II, and they were looking into Cold War studies. And there were some people who were rogue spies, but that happened more in America than it did in England, um, who who did share their stories and make it into something, you know, formidable. Not formidable, sorry. <laughs> something uh, more more sellable for the media and just for people to learn from it. Um, so yeah, and then also it's interesting to think that Dave Bond was a hero, but he didn't have like a real past. I mean, like the books were written, um, and also, yeah, the majority, also the majority of the movies, like 22 movies, um, probably like half of them are actually the books that had to do <laughs> with, with James Bond, and then other authors did take over and did write some stories about James Bond. They were formed into movies as well, but the initial James Bond, like Dr. No, Quant I'm not Quantum, I'm sorry, sorry, that's incorrect. Um, so Dr. No, and most recently, um, Casino Royale, which was actually the first James Bond novel was put to screen, and those are actual books, so it's not just someone wanting to be Ian Fleming and creating a good, good character story. Um, but also his love of Queen and Country 
it was uncanny to any other sort of um, sort of um, sort of hero at the time. So in this case, um, since you did have like a huge icon, and it's interesting because Sean Connery is not English, he is Scottish. So there were a couple of worry warts that were like, no, he can't play it because he's Scottish and James Bond is British and is English. And he ends up being one of the most iconic James Bonds ever. Um, and that also kind of gives into like what it means to be British at the time and who to who to have your trust in because Scots, Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland, Northern Irelanders, and Welsh people in England, they're all considered British. So it's even still now people don't like each other just because they're in different parts of the country, but they're still considered British. British. Um, but yes, it just shows that. You know, just little barriers were broken with you know him being Scottish, and also um, you know it was, it was perfectly fine with the actual author for him to be playing James Bond, which was big too. Um, but yes, the love of Queen Country also kind of came up again, especially in the early '60s when the Cold War was really taking place. Um, so that there was just like a new sort of national nationalism that was happening in a good way, not in a Hitler way. So that was that's important. Okay, so again, with representation. Um, so many critics applauded the J-Fog fr franchise, which they still do now, with the exception of like the latest film, which I thought was okay. It could, it could have been better, but it was okay. It was a good throwback. Um, but historians have compared an equally successful spy series to the James Bond legacy, and that's actually the Harry Palmer series, which I really enjoy. It shows a young Michael Caine like, going out and like, doing all the spy stuff, and it's really interesting with the Ipcris file, um, for example, um, it's just this file that has this really high-pitched whining noise, and it's supposed to like make you obey commands without question. And that's very Soviet sort of technology that people were afraid of. So kind of pitting that in a movie kind of brings a realization to what you know the public's feel fears were, especially like in Britain. Um, but the Harry Palmer franchise was thought of as a thinking man's James Bond. It's not too well known, but it's worth looking into because it is very similar, with the exception of like there's no hardly any misogyny or sexism in it. Um, it's still a very good series that I, I really enjoy, um, but it is a good comparison just to show like what sorts of technology people were afraid of during the time. Um, James Bond as a character representation of Cold War conflict and policies. Um, the reason why people think of Harry Palmer as a thinking man's James Bond is because James Bond just does stuff. He doesn't think about it, he just does it. Anybody can push the button, anybody can cause a war. James Bond could cause a war if he wanted to, I bet. Um, but he just does it. And that shows like a lot of how the community might have been thinking about how it would be possible to just go into a war by accident. Um, so that was something else that worried people at the time. Um, and then we're also going to talk about Margaret Thatcher. Margaret Thatcher was also known as the Iron Lady in Russia. So her her um, her prime her prime ministership didn't start until 1979, um, but she did have very humble upbringings. Um, she was bullied all the time for being super smart and also just for being a girl, just as you do. Um, she graduated Oxford, and she's actually more proud of the fact that she's the only prime minister to have a degree in science instead of political science. She doesn't even like the fact that she's the first prime minister. She, like she loves the fact that she's the one that has a science degree in biochemistry instead of instead of a political science, which is just interesting. Um, so yeah, so she becomes Britain's first female prime minister. She's also very conservative. That and the conservative policies that she has during the time, especially like during the Falkland Wars, um, which actually brought the UK out of the recession was pretty amazing. Um, but the policies and the conservative views that she had made her one of the most hated prime ministers of the time because it looked like she didn't care about anybody. It looked like she just didn't have a heart. Like people often say that she has like a stone for a heart instead. Um, but it's all it's all very interesting only because she's a woman and if a man had been like doing the same exact thing as she was would we give any sort of second look at it? Um, but she did 
hold herself very well. She did go through like certain classes, and if sure if you watch The Iron Lady, which is a great film, um, it'll show you how like she did handle everything in those sorts of situations. Um, but yeah, I like this little cartoon. Oh, it's sad that she had to die, but uh, it just says, "Think it was easy to help do it? Try doing it whilst in a skirt, suit, and high heels." And she was also not one to be oppressed by men. She always liked wearing bright colored suits. Um, so you would just see a bright blue suit or a bright pink suit, skirt suit in Parliament among like gray and black, black suited men. And it was like, oh, that's her. And she just kind of like left her mark on England being like, I did this, you know, without any of your help sort of thing. Because there was very little help for her. Oh, yeah. so, her, so her policies were very controversial at the time. Um, so as a woman, uh, she became a symbol of strength and extreme ambition. She did not care what you thought about her policies, she just did them. She had advisors who just wanted to quit, and some of them did, did in fact quit because of like certain policies that she was saying, because they had such, such um, they just didn't agree with her. And so it was to that extreme that they actually quit. Um, so the most satisfying notion of her term would be proving herself wrong. Um, one time when she was being interviewed by a little kid, it was just for this one fun little TV show that they had in Britain at the t um, back in 1977. Um, a kid asked her, you know, do you think there's ever going to be a female prime minister? And she's like, no, I don't think there's going to be one in my time. And she ends up being the first pre female prime minister, which I thought was great because she just proved herself wrong. And it was just kind of a sign of the times, especially since it was like 1979, going into the 80s, and that sort of wave of feminism also carried her, which was just cool. And then one of her quotes saying, being powerful is like, or is like being a lady, if you have to tell people you are, you aren't. And so she's very adamant about her position, and she just, she just enjoyed it while, while she could, and it was, it still has a big cultural impact in England. Um, when I was there last fall, a lot of people are starting to agree with her policies because she did bring England out of a recession, out of like, yeah, from, because there were like, there were so many strikes, like garbage was literally piling up on the streets because she refused to like pay the wages, or she refused to raise the wages of the of civil servants, but she didn't, and it ended up for her benefit and for England's benefit. And I think that's also something that we have trouble with today um, because she did have such staunch views. Um, she just doesn't, or she, her policies just didn't, they just don't, for better or for worse. And people find themselves being very fond of her now. Um, and that's usually what Cold War Britain was all about. Besides having to go into like the mod scene, and besides having to go into like certain subcultures that weren't like super impactful, I mean, punk was probably one of the most impactful, but it didn't have anything to do with like the Cold War. So, but usually just like the spy films and major people. What has to do, especially in Britain, because it's so small. So, yeah, that's it.